Hello, this is Hawker Devine, and today we are going to continue with SCP-6500, The Path of the Mage. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now, let's get right into this. We were in, we were just starting on Chapter 4. Should I suppose that the last video into three different parts for every supposed chapter it was supposed to be? Nah. My time in Porto Extrano. From the Refugee, The Rule of the Nexus After the End of Anomalies by Philip Vorhorten. Porto Extrano, known internally as NX572, was one of the last nexuses discovered and classified before the crisis began. It is also one of the youngest nexuses in terms of when its knowledge of properties manifested, and did so in a unique way, creating one of the only known nexuses with an extraterrestrial origin. Contemporaneous to the fact Auckland War in 1982, Argentina's Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation was tasked by Leopoldo Gaetieri to secretary from a colonel from a colony on the Arctic Peninsula, under the pretense of a scientific expedition. This was not Argentina's first attempt to do so. In 1978, Argentina went so far as to have a child born in Antarctica in an attempt to claim the Antarctic Peninsula. Peninsula as their territory. The colonists made landfall on the Peninsula on April 1st, 1982, one day before the war broke out, and were trapped there for the next 10 weeks. What transpired in those 10 weeks is largely unknown, but after its regime collapsed, their ship and all colonists returned to a port in Argentina that had been commandeered by the Ministry of Science with the bizarre object in tow. The object resembled an avoid pillar, bulging out on either side with a taper top and a flat bottom. When they called a sun to eat it, it began to emit a gray light. This light caused mutations among the colonists that, while easily concealed under Antarctic winter wear, were much more obvious as in the warmer climates of Argentina. Among those mutations were gills, longer and shaggy body hair, gray. A sclera and the extension of the first two fingers on the right hand by approximately five centimeters. The first mutation is of particular note since it allowed the colonists to activate the its overwhelmer, a terraformer. Unleashed upon the port was a massive way of gray, a light, irreversibly transfiguring the climate and all, all organisms with it and into an alien state. The chloroplasts on the plants in the area turned a vibrant blue. Compatible with a newly gray sunlight. Animals mutated into bizarre parodies of themselves. Cormorants grew a second set of wings around their legs, while Magellanic penguins developed an extended beak containing fully formed teeth. No human gained mutations as extreme as the colonists. But certain expressions of the traits remained, including more prominent body hair and the gray sclera. <sighs> Coming along with these mutations was a sort of emphatic hive mind, a neural network allowing shared emotions which weakened with distance from the nexus. Combined with the alien climate and organisms, this led to the voluntary isolation and alienation of those within the town. When it was rediscovered by a joint Argent Argentinian Foundation exposition in 2009, Argentinian authorities termed it as Porto, Porto Extrano. Today it is overseen by Site 572 with Director Miguel O'Galvin also acting as the mayor of the city. The conflict of interest here seems obvious. This was an attempt by the Foundation to experiment with integrating Cyprus down into local government. What were the final acts of the Department of Dexology while the organization was at its strongest? 2. The Fading Magic When the crisis began, two groups were expected to survive. Extraterrestrial anomalies and anomalous wildlife. In I'd sight, I'd the latter group larger dying out is not surprising, but all involved were shocked when the likes of the SCP is a solidary started to corrode, or when the entire civilization of SCP 
a 3003 collapsed overnight. We reasoned that extraterrestrial organisms and technology were simply beyond the scope of Terran science and not natural laws. Proto Extrata was only one of three known nexuses with an extraterrestrial origin or component. The other two being Socorro of New Mexico and Bactor Huzo Huzo in Phoenix, Arizona. And the loss of its anomalous opponents was immediately devastating to its inhabitants. Once the terraformer failed, citizens were left choking on an oxygenated atmosphere, and both plant and animal life experienced a great dying. Small potatoes compared to the geographic alterations to the dark side of the moon, or the if you to even a Pluto as a, as a planet, but humanity was faced with a sobering realization that drove many astronomers to think. Humanity was alone, once and for all. To this end, I decided to dispatch myself to Porto Extrano. Extraterrestrials were a large blind spot in the study of Nexuses, and I wanted want one last chance to rectify that, to see how the universe would go on with only us in it. <sighs> 3. Redundancy The worst part of the crisis is that few, if any, people outside of the Foundation notice it occurring. Several places of evidence were put down to climate change or changes in international relations or incorrect theories. Above all, it proved to us that we wasted trillions in amnestic production. Most people are willing to believe that magic isn't real and sell for a far more mundane explanation that helps them sleep at night. For example, in June of last year, an extraterrestrial craft crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico. The universe had unearthed evidence of extraterrestrial life on a platter in a city that is famous for being the site of an alleged alien crash. And the world simply shrugged and moved on, as we made a half-hearted attempt to characterize the remains before they turned into the same slurry that an organization organisms eventually become. The Foundation is one of many organizations that knew of the existence of extraterrestrial life days before the crisis was officially declared as extant. The O5s had been debating whether or not to release evidence of non-hostile first contact to the public. The delegation from the other planets spontaneously combusted and minutes before the resolution could be voted upon, rendering the point moot. Some extraterrestrials strained and survived. Glimpses of this can be seen in the eyes of Porto Extrano's inhabitants, who still retain many of the mutations. But there is a listlessness to them, hopelessness, which made me question where my loyalties lie. But all that hopelessness, a tiny spark fell from the sky. 4. Let the flames begin. There was an un unscheduled meteor shower in the, on the night of April 26, and accompanying it, several intense migraines among those who inhabited the town still, myself included. The shower was unprecedented, and had the RC Motel scope still existed, one of the first casualties of the ca crisis, shall lo long shall be missed. All assembled all around it would have been gawping at the screens. This meteor shower had a strange color to it, a green tint over the whole thing, light and below in an odd shade. Stars fell over the water, and one of them fell into the terraforming device at the center of the city, euphemistically called the town square. The land around the terraformer was dead, was a dead, wild jungle, with animal carcasses and bizarre plants surrounding a large metallic pillar. It had once been a lush epicenter that the Foundation had been trying to access for years, but now was nothing but a fire hazard. This green spark of light collided with it and lit a great fire among the bush. Ush. What happened next felt like a warm shower, a sunburn, and a first kiss at the same time. Citizens who had been cut off from Porto Extra Anno's hive mind when he normally perished found themselves reconnected in ways that are impossible to describe. And I was caught in the crossfire. Imagine that you share a brain with your best friends, your family, and all your pets, and you are always happy to see each other. This is roughly what I felt when the network came into my brain with, gray, with the gray light. Joy and comfort, a hug around your mind. The world was full of color in a way it had not been since the crisis began, but somehow there was a sense that this too would fade. 5. The Interloper 
Dr. Catherine Sinclair Irving it's one of the best traumaturgists in the Western Hemisphere. And the fact that she he survived not even a week after her life if in Proto Electrano had returned to normal gave all pause. She arrived. That's what I said. That's what I meant to say. Wow. Since the decline of anomalous phenomena, traumaturgy is advent and they're universally affected by thomic repression syndrome. Sinclair was no different. I had seen her at a conference six months previous, and she seemed miserable. Now she seemed far more chipper. She was different working for the final draft. And communicative. She was alone, explained that her husband was bound to Louisiana where she would join him. She met with Director Galvin. I observed the meeting with her permission. She told us of her goal, to revive magic as a whole. And told us that she needed help. To be more precise, she needed the, pro the item which had caused the terraformers to start up once more. Products on Anno's neural network had, had a very strong tendency for self-reservation, centered around the terraformer. This was evident in 2009, with three expedition members were mauled by mutated citizens following their attempts to remove the, the device. As Galvin showed her the crystal, a creeping fear came over the pair of us, as well as the rest of the town, no doubt influenced by the network. As she touched it, a chill came over the nexus. She was going to take it, and the network would die again. We could not allow that. Galvin drew his service weapon in order to declare to step away. She looked at us like we'd gone crazy, and away we had. The network and us saw us declare as simultaneously an infestation and a dangerous predator, one we had to get rid of before it destroyed the whole colony. With Sinclair to be freezed back down, with Gavin distracting her, I hit her on the head with a chair. Find a more civil allies way to word this so you don't sound like a thug. Well, you were being a thug, though. That's when I realized she had a prosthetic eye. It bounced out of her head and it fell on the floor. We put her in custody while we decide what to do with her. 6. The Slumber. Dr. Sinclair was in a holding cell for all of six hours before she took the initiative. She explained to us that the green shard was one of the seven items that was like it that she had a three e in her possession. She didn't say where or what they were, and we were in such a hurry to put her away that we didn't search for her for jewelry. Fear makes you act irrationally, especially if that fear is compelled. Afterward, I felt sick. I went to see her and apologized, and found her in tears in the corner of her, her cell. I tried to talk, to apologize, thinking she was upset, but at the same time, from what I had seen, Dr. Sinclair was not one to break down, crying under stress. She turned to face me, the left side of her face covered in blood. As I stepped back, I saw that her prosthetic eye had been replaced with a red, orange, and yellow orb, one that thrummed with power as she looked at me. And I know oh, that this new eye saw me. She blinked, and the blood evaporated from her face the eye assuming a more natural color. Then her body brimmed with magic. She simply stepped toward the reflected glass of Vader that I separated this holding stuff from the rest of the world. Put a hand on my forehead and compelled me to sleep. I awoke 12 hours later. The meteorite was gone. The entire site had been incapac incapacitated. But the town was whole. Sinclair had commanded a vehicle from our bay and driven to the nearest airport, leaving a note of apology for all involved. As I write, I am bound for... Or Doval in Australia. I did not want to spend one more second in a city that would com that could compel me to such violence for the sake of preserving itself. Doctor Sinclair, last I heard, was bound for Louisiana, and La Rue Macabre. <sighs> I love this document. It has so many different writing styles going on through it, and it still tells one continuous story. So, there I was, walking through Nolens, walking the same path from Takata or to Mohogan, hoping to get into La Rue, like I hope every day. It never happened before, but that day it did, and La Rue never looked better. It was warm in there, steamy like we it tucked up inside a gaiter's gullet, and I see ra a party all around and never a knot. Like it was a mod- I- like we were Mardi Gras with pe- 
And you have Hoodoo who's showing. Oh man, that's, that's like what's there too. Er, and Papa Legba and the Baron too. Have I even saw Bayou Boys? And what? Uh, it's a right surprise to see him. Bayou Boys, you see, are, are, are they should, and they should cause LaRue to just vanish in the thin air. But now here they was, drinking like nothing. Had never happened to LaRue. There were straight angels on, on, on them um, too. Girl with fire hair and a man with respectable dreads. They had they should, and, and seals on him. Was looking like Taurus. Girls stink like bug spray from a, uh, from half a mile off. They was talking with Papa Alegba, acting all proper like, as if that, as if that girl knew what she were dealing with. They were amazing the way she were carrying herself, giving them, them all fancy e e titles and names. Too proper. I think that's what a biz all met. And, and that's the off, cause you you look at her like she were a damn annoying fly. Girl mage, he's fat. He's fat. You think you could just walk in here and act like you ain't into Gaza and all this? But not even a week ago that I were a very smart spider. Or again, like the four times. Lost all my stories. Stories that you stink of. She look at him like he were speaking a foreign language. It was Queen's English. And she look at Nancy like he were from Mars. She tried not to respond. I did you know, So bad I dare not repeat it. But her husband stepped in. And here sounds like Queen's but more refined. Often that makes sense. Lord Van Nancy, he said. With due respect, we come to remake all magic. Not just a root. So if I could be so kind as to let us have... At the codex. No, I don't know what this codex were. I'm just telling the story as I saw it. Damn. Trying to speak. I think this is Australian. It's really hard. Old man Nancy gave him a look. He gave a doll to Asian towards the end. But the real side closing down. Kind of look that fills your veins with the venom of shame. You smell white, he spat. You talk white, and you work for the whitest organi organization in the world. This guy about to start saying how the nation is all diverse and multi emotional but Nancy just said, I mean, the mind of the nation is white. The mighty conqueror, the savior, the light in the dark. <laughs> how many men in, in binders under the nation? Those class Ds. All released, his man said. Hey, no need for them no more. And I suppose, and I suppose oh, that makes the original class D's K then. Get out of our street, Dacian. Now hold up, what about them Bayou boys? They ain't Dacian. They don't fire LaRue, the old man snorted. Them knows how, how to walk on, on my webs without getting tangled. Do you, do you know o of El Dacian? <sighs> Jeez, talking in this accent is really, really gonna make me not like this part because, goddamn, it feels weird. And that's when old man and Nancy he had of his queer, this queer drool, pure blue, clearer than any water or sky seen in Larue in years. It was like the bayou itself sprung to life. The nations got strung up like we, like it were web, strong as any old. Oh man, and Nancy, he ever make. You look at him like I like keep we're gonna I have him for luncheon. Oh man, Nancy, look out! Out the mage girl's eyes and wore around his neck. Grizzly, if you ask me. God damn, it's getting worse. He had to I'm struck up in front out of the and never and not for hours. I say back to be let, let down. This girl mage almost got out once, but she forgot to woman Nancy ain't no hedge witch. Every time she talked for the next hour, she he spat out, out spiders. Then we hear the stomp, stomp, stomp in the boots. Those are men and women, all in black, wearing 
in, in GLC insignias in LaRue. I don't know how they got in, how to get in here, but when Nancy see him, you order every. You want out of LaRue. Of course, I said, someone has to tell the story. The GLC walk up, up before our old man Nancy. America with forward, looking right pissed. He limped like he had a, a bullet in his shoulder and started him and put a gun onto his chest. Says, old man Nancy, he has to give up the baubles or else he and all of the his regulars get it. Well, did this GLC make a mistake? Call him a Nancy. Very rude. Oh, this guy again? I'm sure this name, about how he said his name were, thought he were all high and mighty. Nancy knew he were. He tried making a web out of the bay it's itself, tried dragging a GOC man in, but a GOC man wanted Nancy riled up. Old man Nancy wrapped his blue bubble exposed round his neck, but ripped it off and shot old man Nancy right in the chest. One, two, ten times! Damn, this is getting hard. So we're like the plants and all the animals started screwed for the birds in the bayou, which is the spiders that old man Nancy takes care of spider silk. will come out of his chest and take on the GLC's his hands and burning them. But GLC full away, broke the bobble too. The husband gets let down and tried to jump and beat out, but Lou is going crazy. The streets bulging and turning into black water and spider webs and grave dirt. And, and never seen nothing the likes of it. It's shooting Nancy where it killed Ellen LaRue. Then old man Nancy takes off his skin. Hey, he'd never do that, but he needed to, just so he could make enough web to stop LaRue from completely falling apart. Drew a seaman man holds the bobbles, opens away, and takes his old kit and a caboodle through it. Old man Nancy were bleeding, but he weren't dying. Then it stopped the girl mage and her, her man from trying to heal him. Old man Nancy starts to ring him, saying, and he were fine, and they should just leave him. But when Nancy were trying to keep look, all of the root together, and we, and he were failing. So the man with dreads, he picks up his yellow bobble. Oh, uh, as and gives it to old man Nancy. The girl man scoops up what, what's left of the blue one and combines it with the green one. She looks real sad, like, but gave it to old man Nancy. He used the bubbles to start undoing the damp and uh, to LaRue. It looks like almost a whole rainbow for a while. When LaRue saw it look solid, I gave, gave him some privacy and went to explore the street again. LaRue were open again and despite what the GOC did, it did, it, it was still on my home. But I knew as I walked into the wet, hey, LaRue ain't never are closing down and magic ain't never dying. <sighs> the Boring Chronicle Boring Organ Monday, May 17th Two dollars Animal Rampage, Rock City, Wilson's Wildlife Head in Custody By Driscoll Wolf, Wildlife Correspondent This is a, a picture of Toph Lynn, a panda escaped from Wilson's Wildlife Services during the Event. On Monday, chaos reigned and boring as dozens of animals from Wilson's Wildlife Services broke through the front gates and flooded the streets. The animals were apparently released by I, I, I fail in Wilson, owner of Wilson's Wildlife Services, an animal rescue facility famous throughout Clackamas County for its various variety of exotic and bizarre wildlife, which the organization terms critters. The facility was in danger of shutting down following a period of what an official statement from what is Wilson called global environmental decline that is detrimental to the ecosystems that support our critters. However, Wilson's wildlife I've services experienced a massive resurgence in business in the past month, while what was officially reported as a meteor strike in the middle of the facility. The object, which resembled an indigo shower of glass, had been on display in Wilson's wildlife services main building as part of a fundraising effort. This item apparently played a key but unknown role in this event. In the early hours of Monday morning, a pair of unknown individuals, a white woman with red hair in her late 30s, and an African-American male in their late 
in the mid to late forties. I arrived at the front gate of Wilson's Wildlife I've Complex with several members of the Clackamas County East Sheriff's Department in tow. Ms. Wilton was seen lighting them into the facility up to 8 a.m. Several witnesses reported bursts of indigo light originating from within the WWS facility. Then at 8.07, when children were preparing to go to school, several animals broke loose. <sighs> witnesses reported that Ms. Wilson was seen riding a stride an animal described as a unicorn with claws instead of hooves. Holding the indigo o, o meteorite. It was speculated that she was using the meteorite to control this animal and several others. These reports are unsubstantiated. They are currently under uh, investigation by the Chronicle. Notable incidents of damage include the raising of four these free school facilities by a giant wombat, a small forest fire set by deers with flaming antlers. And several individuals reporting strange dreams following the sighting of a, a taper within the, the town's unincorporated area. Furthermore, the two individuals seen entering the wildlife complex, Wilson's wildlife complex in the early hours of morning appear to have been engaged to, have been attempted to engage in dialogue with Miss Wilson. This reporter attempted to report from them but was declined any comment as they were engaged in combat with what appeared to be a sheep that was emitting large amounts of electricity. Remarkably, there are no fatalities, and only one entry, a woman whose name has often been released to the Boring Chronicle, was apparently gored by a u by the unicorn that Ms. Wilson was riding, but was reportedly in stable condition at a hospital in, in Portland. Ms. Wilson is currently in police custody, having surrendered herself up to the gory incident. An oral statement was obtained. I'm not sure how much I can tell you, but what's been happening for years now is, things have been dying, an ecological crisis, like none of you are aware of. The creatures are just one part of it. When I saw the gem sun coming from the sky, I saw it was revitalizing the creatures in the pens, and so I couldn't help myself. I held on to it, and when my supervisors came to collect it, I got mad. I wanted the animals to protect themselves, and I swear to God, they let themselves out of their own freaking cages. When I grabbed the gem, Bobble, Codex, she called it, if you can believe that. I told them to, uh, to protect themselves, and that's what they did. The whereabouts of several of the, of the animals are currently unknown. An organization could so, called Soft Cruelty Toys Fest has been had a temporary ownership of Wilson's Wildlife Services. And Montgomery Rec Reynolds, a spokesperson for the organization, assured the Chronicle that they will continue to provide services equivalent or greater in quality to and those provided by Wilson's Wildlife Services. <sighs> oh dear. Trying to read it in a news anchor voice is not easy. Actually, I think that's a good stopping point. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I'm going to continue from where we left off tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!